Sunday school teachers, Lord, as they teach your word. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a blessing it is to have a joyful group here this morning. Oh, we got a little hummy dummy going on there, huh? Woo! All right. You guys can hear me? All right. So, we're blessed to be here this morning. God is so good to us, isn't he? Amen, brother. Amen. Good to see everybody's smiling faces today. It's awesome to be here. So turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 as we continue to go through 1 John chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I'm excited about the Word today and, and God's plan to touch our lives with it. So we're just going to pray it in. Father, we open our hearts to you today to your Word. We ask that we could just receive what you have for us today. Lord, you're such a blessing to us, Lord. You're our Savior, our Lord. We love you so much, Lord, and it's only because you first loved us, Lord. You gave yourself, you gave your life on Calvary so our sins could be forgiven. And we're so blessed, Lord, to be able to have a personal relationship with the true and living God. Lord, what a glory you are. What a wonder you are, Lord. And our faith and our hearts and our minds and everything are fixed on you this morning, Lord. Please speak to our hearts and encourage each life here today, Lord, with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's just start in verse 1 and read through again. Uh, we've been taking this piece by piece because there's so much to glean in it. And, but I'd like to start back in verse 1. Uh, chapter 2, 1 John, verse 1. My little children, these things I have written to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of the Father is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him also himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, and, but an old commandment which had been from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which is true in you and in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for, your, for, for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. 
I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the Father. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. We won't get past those verses 12 through 17 today. We're going to focus on 12 through 17 today and talk about those verses. And he says, uh, I write to you little children because your sins have been forgiven. We have to remember the Apostle John here uh, called everybody in the church little children at this time because he was like 100 years old when he wrote this. And so the whole body of Christ becomes little children. But at the same time, we also know that whether you're 20 years old when you get saved or whether you're 70 years old when you get saved, you become a little child. You become new in the faith, and praise God for that. And so what he tells us that our sins need to be forgiven. He says, remember, your sins have been forgiven you. And what a glorious thing that is, to think about that. That our sins have been forgiven us. That's, that thought needs to resonate in our minds, in our hearts, continually, all through our Christian walk with the Lord. Because that's what God paid, paid the greatest price to see that our sins were forgiven. He gave his only begotten son to die on Calvary so we could be free from our sins. Praise the Lord. So as we realize how great that is in our life, we continue to focus on that and reflect on that. No matter how long we've been a Christian, whether we've been a Christian just beginning out in our Christian walk or whether we've been a Christian for 30 or 40 or 50 years, we're still reflecting on how the great salvation of our God has changed our life. Praise the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yes. He says, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And what, a, what an interesting thing that is, because the fathers of the faith, or the fathers who have known Christ for a long time, men and women who have been walking in their walk with the Lord for years and years and years, and become strong in their faith. They become like oak trees planted by the rivers of water, rooted deeply in the word of God and rooted deeply in their walk and their fellowship with Christ. So he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning, knowing God, walking with God. There's no substitute for it. You can't, the experience that we get as we grow up in Christ, as we walk with him year after year, uh, and our faith begins to grow as we see how he works out everything in our lives. You know what an awesome thing that is to think about that because we've been through, each one of us in our Christian walk, we've been through a lot of struggles and a lot of trials. Mom? And yes, Dottie. I don't want to sound big, but when, when uh, I was a gangster, was still two years back, we didn't know if we were going to have Ronnie the next day or not. He had this big, huge, awful operation coming along. I mean, I do believe there was more praying in, in this town than you could ever imagine. And he went in, he come out, and yeah, I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm doing okay. Well, wow, look at him now. Praise the Lord. That's God. Praise the Lord. So we've been, through, we've been through a lot of experiences in our life. We've seen uh, God answer many prayers in our life. That's right. We've seen God take us through trials and sufferings and tribulations and hardships. And we've overcome because of God. He's there with us, right? And so he writes to the fathers, there's no substitute for walking with Christ. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. You know, if you're here today and from ages 16 to 25 in this church today, you have already stepped into overcoming the wicked one just by your presence being in church at that age. Yes. Yes. Because the world is after the young people today of, uh, in a great degree. And the reason he's after the young people is because 
You know, when we go into war and spiritual battle, and he's going to talk about that down again when he talks about the young people again. He says, the young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. When you go through a spiritual battles of this world and all the temptations that this world has, throwing at you at the age of 16 through 25, you know, the world has a strong pull to try to get you to go the wrong direction. But because the word of God is abiding in your heart, because you have the word of God living in your heart, what a great and awesome thing that is. God gives us the victory in that. He gives you the victory in that. You become strong because the word of God abides in you. And praise God for that. You know, uh, it's uh, when we have battles, spiritual battles, you know, we don't send the little children into the battle. We don't send the old men into the battle, but the young men are the ones that are on the front lines of the battle. And you young men here today, you're on the front lines of the battlefield. You are the strong, and, and God sends you out into that battlefield to, to battle and serve the Lord. Now, I know that the older generation, too, is also a strong in that spiritual battle because we've learned the tactics of the enemy. We've learned how to, we learned his snares and, the, and his little things he throws at us to try to trip us up and sidetrack us and all those things. But the young men, I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. Man, if you're here today and you're in church, that's the first step to overcoming the wicked one. You know, the wicked one doesn't want young people in church. What a resistance he has to keep the young people out of church today. But greater is he that is in me than he is in the world, right? Yes. God is greater and God strengthens those young men as the word abides in them. <clears throat> I write to you little children because you have known the father. You have known the father. You know, when you think about a little child as they're growing up, you know, and they begin to talk and, and then they begin to go to school. Uh, their greatest hero in their life is their father. You know, they go to school and they hear about the founding fathers, the presidents, and great men of the past. But, you know, they hear about all those things. But truly, the one that's really their hero is their father. Their father is their hero because in most cases, I'm not saying this in all cases, but in most cases that's the way because they saw the, the father's love and care and nurture for the child. Uh, that's, the, that's what we see in our Heavenly Father. We see His love, care, and nurture for His children. And so we write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. They have known the love of the Father. They have known the care and, and protection and nurture of the Father and the Father's love. Now, some of you here today may have not had that Father's love that you needed when you were growing up. You may, you may have had the opposite of that. But one thing we can know is the Heavenly Father never lets us down. God the Father always comes through for us. No matter what we've been through in our past with our earthly fathers, we can learn to be loved again by receiving the love of our Heavenly Father. Praise God. And then he goes back and again, I write to you young men because you are strong and the word abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. When we walk, young men, as you walk in the Word of God, as you learn to put the Word of God in your heart, as you memorize Scripture, as you learn to live out those Scriptures by walking out those Scriptures, by walking out the Word of God, you become strong in your life. You become strong, and the enemy, you have victory over the enemy. So he says, because you are strong, the Word of God abides in you. You have overcome the wicked one. And how, does, how do we overcome the wicked one but by standing strong in faith in the word of God, right? So remember Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness, what did he do? He quoted the word of God, you know, back to the enemy and he had the victory, right? So we know that's how we get the victory is through the word of God and having that word abiding in our hearts. We're strong in the Lord and the young men, praise God for the young men. I appreciate the young men here in our church today. They're taking over everything in the church. I love it. You know, we need it, you know. Uh, they're, they're starting to work in the music ministry and the sound ministry and, and the uh, online stuff. We wouldn't have anything online if we didn't have the young men here, believe me. We wouldn't have the YouTube videos online. We wouldn't have those words and, and scriptures up on the YouTube videos. 
We wouldn't have this stuff up on the screen if it wasn't for the young people that, that doing that stuff, you know, they're taking up the mantle and service for God. Praise God for those young people. God is so good, you know. He's so good to us all the time. I'm happy today that we can just be here in this place. I, the freedom that we have to worship the Lord, to gather together as the body of Christ, what a great thing that is. You know, the Bible says, don't forget the assembling of your sake, uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the body of Christ. And I, I, I'm telling you this morning that we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to gather here. No matter what the world tells us, we're going to gather and we're going to, we're going to praise the Lord. We're going to worship together. You know, uh, God has given us, told us to do that. And we're going to be faithful to God to do that. Praise the Lord. Then he goes in and says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Who's John speaking to here again? He's speaking to the church, of course. This letter is written to you and I. But before we define what it means to not love the world, let us consider what it doesn't mean. Not loving the world does not mean that we should not love people in the world, right? You know, we should love people in the world. God clearly commands us to love everyone in the world, including our enemies. In Mark 12, 31, love your neighbor as yourself, he said. In John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Matthew 5, 44, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Not loving the world doesn't mean that we're not to enjoy or utilize the good gifts that God has given us in the world. And we see that God has blessed us with many things. James 1, 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, whom there is no shadow of turning. You see, God has provided many good things for us here. You know, we're, we're blessed just to have fresh air, aren't we, these days? We realized that when we had months and months of smoke where we couldn't breathe, we, all of a sudden we began to appreciate the simplicity of just being able to breathe fresh air. But God has provided many good things for us to enjoy, and we ought to receive them with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says, For every creature of God is, is good, and nothing is to be refused. It is received with thanksgiving. So we see that God has put a lot of good things here for us to enjoy. But we're going to talk about what does it really mean not to love the world. And first we need to understand that it's not the created world itself that is sinful, but it's the rebellious anti-God and anti-Christ system that's in the world today. And that system is raising its ugly head today like never before. The spirit of this world, which comes from the God of this world, Satan, is set against God and his people and his ways. This anti-Christ and anti-God system is out to destroy God's people. It's out to destroy everything that God's people are influencing the world to do. And so in that sense, it's a system that's in the world that's anti-God and anti-Christ. I want to take you over to Psalm 2 just for a second. Psalm 2. And just look at this passage of scripture with me. Are you there? Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So what do we see here? We see the nations of the world plotting and raging against what? Against the Lord and against his anointed people, against you and me. The world system, that anti-God, anti-Christ world system 
raising its ugly head to try to destroy what God wants to use for good in the world. He says, let us break their bonds. That's their, what they're saying. He says, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So they have an agenda to destroy everything that's good that God put in place. I, I don't know if you've noticed that, but everything good that God has put in place, that there's an agenda by the evil one to destroy it all. To take it all down. To come against it all. And you know, as the world system raises its ugly head in an effort to wipe out Christianity, to, to wipe out the influence of God in the world, and to, and to wipe out the name of God, and, and, and close churches, and all the things it's trying to do today, they think they're getting the victory over all this, right? But look what the Lord says in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and, dis and distress them in his deep displeasure. In other words, God sees all the things that's going on and he's got a handle on it. And you know what? He says, the Bible says he turns around what the evil meant for, what the devil meant for evil. God turns it around and uses it for good. Christians are being strengthened today in ways they've never been strengthened before. Their faith is growing stronger than it's, never, than it's ever been in the history of the last probably 30, 40, 50 years. Because there's opposition is closing in. Because the enemy is, is pressing the world because he knows his time is short and he doesn't have a lot of time left. So he's going to do everything he can to take out everything that God represents, including God's people. But the Lord says, we'll rise up as a light in a dark place. Well, rise and shine, he says, all my people. Rise and shine and let your light shine in the world today. Let, let your light rise up and shine. I know there's many people now that are tar starting to take a stand against different things that are ungodly. One of those things is that they say that a lot of churches can't meet together anymore. They, they want to shut down churches because they say that you can't come together because of the COVID or whatever they, they're going to throw at us next. You can't assemble together. But God tells his people that not to forget the assembling of themselves together. He tells us that we're supposed to meet together. He says we're supposed to praise the Lord. Why is that so important? Because your influence, as you come into this place, you bring the Holy Spirit into this place, you come and you encourage another person as you come into this place. You, you lift somebody's spirit. And we're all going through trials. We're all going through troubles in this world. He, Jesus said, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. We're going to have trials, but he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He's going to walk us through those trials. He's going to get us through. He'll see us through all the trials we've been through. Now, you guys have all been through trials. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Has God seen you through your trials and your difficulties? Amen. amen. And so we know it's true. We know the Lord is true. and We know his word is true. And so 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things that we have been freely given, that have been freely given to us. And so we haven't received the spirit of the world. Also go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. One of my favorite chapters. Ephesians chapter 2. And let's just look at a few verses here, starting in verse 1. You who you and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So what do we see here again? The course of this world, that trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins according to the course of this world. That course is direction, the direction the world is going. According to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, 
and we're by nature's children of wrath, just as others. And we can't stop there because we have to go to verse 4 and see what God has done in that situation. But God, who is rich in mercy, uh, because of his great love, which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. You know, what a powerful thing that is. But we see the influence of the world, the course of the world, is to take people down the road that leads to death, the road that leads to sin. And that, that is what John is talking about. In chapter 2, or 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. You want to turn there? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4. But even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. So what do we see here? We see it's, it's about the world, the minds of those whose minds the God of this world has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of Christ might shine in their lives. And so we see right now in the world, there's an agenda, there's a move, there's an antichrist spirit. And we talked about, John talks about this. He says there's many antichrists have already come. And there will be one antichrist world ruler in the end. But many antichrists have already come. And that spirit of antichrist is here. And that spirit of Antichrist is like we said, is to lead people down a road that leads to death. Lead people down a road that goes to destruction. Lead people away from God. Basically, putting a shadow over the light of God. Blocking the light of God from shining through. And so we see that move today in the world. And that's what John is talking about. Don't love the world or the things of the world. And he's going to tell you why. He's going to tell you specifically why you're not supposed to love the world. He said, the lust of the flesh. What is the lust of the flesh? The lust of the flesh includes sexual immorality, gluttony, gluttony, and other in indulgences. So we see the lust of the flesh takes us down the wrong road. And what does the world put in front of us? He puts the, the, the world's agenda and controlled and powered by Satan is putting those things in front of people to try to tempt them. Uh, sexual immorality, gluttony, and, and, and other kinds of indulgences. The lust of the eyes is the root of covetousness. It's the greedy desire for material riches and possessions of this world. And so if the enemy can get our eyes off of God and get our eyes upon the world, he's going to get us chasing after the things of the world instead of chasing after the things of God. It's as simple as that. He's going to try to convince people that they can be happy and fulfilled and satisfied if they just have one more thing, one more material possession. If they can just get a little bit more money, they're going to be happy. If they can just get a little bit more land, they're going to be satisfied. Or whatever the temptation is he's throwing at people, he's trying to convince them to go into the materialistic world, material riches and possessions of this world, to have greed, to have great desire for these things. But what we need to have is great desire for our Lord Jesus Christ. What we need to have is more desire for God. More of the Lord and less of me. More of the Lord and less of the world. Praise the Lord. What, where we find true contentment and inner peace is when we really have the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. The peace that passes all understanding living in our hearts. And we put our minds upon him. That's where we have true peace. And finally, he says the pride of life. The pride of life is boasting of ambition and achievement. A thirst for the honor and bestowed by an applause received from the world. You know, uh, the pride of life. Boasting 
and great ambitions and achievements. People will say, you know, what success is, is to measure how much achievement you have in this world. The more you have in this world, they say, the more successful you are. You know, and most people buy into that. Believe me, that's a strong pull. But Jesus says we're not to put our minds on this world. We're putting our minds on where we're headed, our final destination. We're not of this world, right? We're on our way to a place where he's created. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. In John 14, 1 through 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to that place, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So God is trying to get us our focus upon him. You know, with Christ, you can have nothing materialistically and be perfectly happy. You can have nothing that this world has to offer, and you can be completely satisfied in your life. If you have enough of Jesus... If you have enough of God, if you realize that you're only going to be here for a short time and then you're going to be with him for how long? How long, guys? Okay, so this we measure time here. It's nothing compared to what's going to be eventually, right? And God is bringing us into that place. So these uh, these things he shows us here, the pride of life leads to boasting about what we have or what we have achieved. So Jesus was tempted by Satan with all three of these things in the wilderness. When he was up in the wilderness, the devil came to him and he tempted him with all three of these things. Let's just take a quick look at that. Uh, Matthew 4. And Matthew 4, verse 1. And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness and to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. <coughs> now when the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be bread. Command these stones to be bread. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple. He said to them, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And uh, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he said to him, all these things I give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And and Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written... You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. The same trick that enticements that the devil was putting upon Jesus in those days are the same enticements he puts on everybody in the world today to try to get them off course. Try to get them to turn away from worshiping and serving God to loving the world. And when you start to love the world, you fall into the world system. And that world system is bent on destruction. It's bent on evil. And so we notice that Jesus quoted these things in response. In contrast to these manifestations of the love of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Christians are commanded to imitate Christ and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. That's what we're called to do. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. That's right after Timothy. Titus chapter 2. And verse 11. And he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. 
looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that, way, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Praise the Lord. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And so when a person is converted to Christ, he or she, of course, becomes a new creation in Christ with new desires. The old desires are gone. The old sinful nature is put to death, and a new nature is brought forth by the indwelling presence of God the Holy Spirit, that new nature, that new life we get from the indwelling presence of God the Holy Spirit. And so the world's passions belong not to the new nature, but to the old nature. All those old passions belong to the old nature, the old self. But our new nature is a new nature, isn't it? Uh, first Peter, if you go to First Peter chapter 1 with me. First Peter, just uh, where you were, take a right, or is it a left? Take a left, yeah. Okay, and go back there, toward, toward Revelation anyway. Go back there and go to 1 Peter 1. We'll read uh, 13 through 16. He says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, what a, what a statement that is. Gird up the loins of your mind. Strengthen your mind. And how do we strengthen our mind but by the Word of God? Right? So the world wants to put one thing into our mind, but God's telling us to put His Word into our minds. The world wants to bring confusion, but God takes away our confusion with his word. The world wants to lie to us, but God brings truth to us through his word. So you see, the opposites are just major contrast between each other. The world wants to go one way, God wants you to go another way. So he says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, here we again, we're talking about what has Jesus done for me? <laughs> what has he done for me? He saved me from my sin. I'm not the person I used to be. Praise God. He's delivered me from darkness and brought me into his light. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. When a person really is converted to Christ, he or she is a new creation. We talked about that. Instead of living for ourselves, we now live for Christ. We now live for Christ. Christ is our goal. We want to live for him. We want to serve him. We want to be with him forever and ever in eternity. Praise God. And what a glorious thing it is to have Christ in us. To have Christ in us. We have the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts, in our lives. He guides us. He directs us. What a wonderful thing that is. Amen. You know, he gives us direction. He keeps us on a course that leads to life. He keeps, us out, he keeps us from going over the wrong direction and falling off the cliff. The Holy Spirit is always speaking to us, correcting us. When we're out of, when we're out of uh, off base, he corrects us and brings us back to the place we need to be. He always does that. So Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So instead of seeking to follow our selfish will, we need now seek to do God's will. 1 John 2.17, it says, He who does the will of God abides forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. So instead of being conformed to the values and attitudes of this world, we are be, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Transformed by the renewing. Of, we need a transformation. A transformation needs to take place in our minds. Because the world's pull is so strong. It's trying to drag us down one road, and God's saying, hey, stay on the straight and narrow path. But the, the enemy is trying to drag us off to the right, drag us off to the left, trying to get us to agree with the world. To, to adopt the thoughts of the world, to think somehow that the world is going to change for better. Listen, it's, there's two things. It's either light or darkness. 
people are either walking in light or darkness. They're either on God's side or they're, they're on Satan's side. There's an, agenda, there's an agenda for Satan to take down and destroy the world, and there's an agenda for God to see the world saved. And the only way the world's ever going to change is when men's hearts all come to know Christ as their Savior. That's the only way the world's ever going to change. You know, And we have to understand that. We really do need to understand that. So uh, Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we have to be transformed. Our minds are being transformed. So how is our minds transformed? It's by the word of God, isn't it? Okay. So if we don't take the word of God in and, and feed on it, like we need this nourishment, it's so important for us, then we're not going to be nourished. We're not going to have that nourishment. We're, we're not going to be conformed or transformed. Our minds are not going to be transformed. They're going to be taken off the wrong way. So we have to understand that pretty much everything you see in the world today is against you. The media is against you. The television programs are against you. Pretty much everything you see being perpetrated by the world is against you to take you down the wrong path, the wrong way. Trying to get you to think and believe a lie that's not true that goes against God's word. You know, pretty much everything now is that way. And so we really need to have the word of God transform our lives. Even though uh, we ought to love people in the world and enjoy the good things God bestows upon us, we also must be careful not to give them first place in our hearts. Now, God has created some wonderful things. We live in a great place right here, guys. Crater Lake, just up the road from us. One of the great wonders of the world. We, go, we see the beauty of God's creation. Oregon's got just about everything. You've got the desert, the mountains, the coast. It's all beautiful. It's all God's creation. But we have to be careful about those things, not to give them first place in our life. If we do, we make a good thing then into an idol. We can make a good thing into an idol. Our God is a jealous God, and he forbids idolatry. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. John tells us at the end of this first John, the last verse in in 1 John chapter uh, 5, the last verse, he says that little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourself from idols. So he warns us about these things. And this is why it's so important for us to love God first and foremost in our lives. The reason why the first commandment is the greatest and the first commandment is the first commandment is for a reason. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength. There's a reason for that. And the reason for that is to keep us from idolatry. It really is, because when we put God first in our lives, and we love God first, then we're not going to be running after things that we can turn into idols. Now, Jesus takes it even a little bit farther. He talks about it. Jesus said, Whoever loves their mother or father, son or daughter or even their own life more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves their mother, father, son, or daughter, or even their own life is not worthy of me. Jesus is warning us there that we, we can quickly get wrapped up in idols. Very quickly. Things can become idols to us. And whatever we put before God... If we put anything before God, it becomes an idol. It's considered to be an idol. God has to be first in our lives. He's the creator. He created us. He's the one that gives us life. You see, without God today, we wouldn't be breathing right now. Every breath that we take is given to us by God. You know, the world doesn't agree with that. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. In the world trying to convince people that God doesn't exist, that there is no God, and, and the reality of Christianity is all a bunch of falseness. It's all a bunch of imagination. They say it's all in people's imaginations. And so, you know, the world is, of course, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. That's why we can never love the world, 
That's why we can never wrap our arms around the world. That's why we can't be friends with the world. Because the world is our enemy. The world is our enemy. And uh, to love God above this world, we must continually renew our minds with the word of God and set our minds first and foremost on what's spiritual instead of what's earthly. Okay, so Colossians 3, 1 through 4 talks about that. Setting our minds on the things that are spiritual instead of the things that are earthly. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above and not on the things of the earth. For you died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who, are, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Praise the Lord. So we have to be looking for the return of Christ. We have to be expecting it, waiting patiently, but also active in the work that he calls us to do. Because we know there's not a lot of time left, so what are we to do? Proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, our neighbors are dying. Our family members are dying. They don't know Jesus. So how can we do that? You know, it's the hardest thing to do is to get your family members that don't know Christ to accept Christ. Especially coming from you, you know. Because they have a resistance toward their own family oftentimes. But you know what? We can pray that God would send someone else to them to speak to them. We could pray that all the situations of life would lead them to a place where they become desperate for Jesus Christ. Sometimes hardships are a good tool to bring people to Christ. Right now, God is letting the world go through a lot of hardships. There's storms, there's tornadoes, there's floods, there's earthquakes, there's fires, there's disaster and devastation everywhere. And some people say, why would a loving God let all these things come upon the earth? But you know what? It's waking people up. It's showing them that they need help, that they need to cry out to God for help. That God is the one who's protected them and sustained their life. And without God, they have nothing. Also, wiping out the thought of materialism. People are so living and wrapped up in materialism. Because when they lose something, then they say, I've lost everything. But you know, the Christian, when he loses something, he doesn't lose everything. He still has the most valuable thing that he ever needed, and that's Jesus Christ. That's the promises of God's word, and that's the promise of his, uh, eternal life. So no matter what happens, we win, you see. No matter what happens, we win as believers in Jesus Christ. And so John... Tells, tells us that the seduction of the world falls into three different categories, and he names them. The lust of the flesh. Paul says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9.27. The lust of the eyes. David says, I, set, I will set, set no wicked thing before my eyes. Psalm 103, 1. The pride of life. Jesus was one who addressed that. Jesus overcame this by making himself of no reputation. Taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Philippians 2, 7. So when John said, do not love the world, he's talking about the community of sinful humanity that is united in rebellion against God. either for him or you're against him. You're either on God's side or you're on the other side. You see, and God is calling people today, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Which side will you be on? Which side will you choose to go? This is why we can't love the world or make friends with the world. The world is under the evil sway and control of the enemy. So remember, John has already told us that if we walk in sin's darkness and claim to be, have fellowship with God, we're lying. You can't have the world and have God too. You can't go along with the world and live in the world and be under the sway of Satan and go along with his program and love God. Now there's something to consider 
in your spiritual life. And I'm going to close with these few thoughts here. We usually, as believers, think we're more biblically minded than we really are. Thought number one. (laughs) We think we're more biblically minded than we really are oftentimes. But, you know, the reason why we think that is because of the influence upon the world has, has upon us. The world is always gnawing away at us. The world is always gnawing away at our moral values. The world is always gnawing away on our purpose in life is to serve God. And he's telling us to serve ourselves. Get as much as you can get. You know, obtain as much as you can obtain in this world. Jesus said, hey, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. You know, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust won't corrupt you. You know? And so there's a big difference, a big difference, right? So we usually think we think more biblically than we really do. We, we need to take a look at our habits of thinking and see if they follow more the world or God the Father. Think of your standard for success. Is it worldly or godly? Would you consider the Apostle Paul to be a success or a failure? See, in the world's view, he's a, he's a failure. But in God's view, he's a giant. Right? Okay? So, think about your standards. uh, The standard for spirituality. Is it worldly or godly? Uh, There is a worldly spirituality out there, and people are embracing that worldly spirituality. And you know, that worldly spirituality is the spirituality that says, all roads lead to heaven. All paths lead to God. All religions are right. That's the worldly spirituality. And we can all be together as one. You know, that's the worldly spirituality. But Jesus says our fellowship is truly with the Father and with the Son. Our fellowship is with the Holy Spirit. Our fellowship is with the body of Christ and the Word of God. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from me, there is none other. There's no other way that man can be saved except to the name of Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. And so, wow, what a difference again. What a distinction. See, the world wants us to compromise. Compromise the word of God. Compromise your standards, your faith, and your belief. And just take in a little compromise over here. It's all right. In the name of love. If we love people, we want to introduce them to the truth of the word of God. We don't want to take them down a path. We don't want to compromise our faith. We can't do that. We can never do that. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Right? And so if the Bible teaches us, that's where we got to stand. Okay? we got to stay in that course. Uh, consider uh, the standards of a person. Think about the standards of what makes a person of the opposite sex appealing to you. Is this a worldly standard or is it a godly standard? Think about your spirituality. Is it worldly or godly? Uh, This is going to show us that we really need to be conformed and transformed by the renewing of our minds. We really need that transformation to take place in the renewing of our minds. So the last part of this section, he says... Uh, the world is passing away in the lust thereof it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So what do we have to do? We have to stay in the will of God. We have to stay in the will of, stay in the will of God to stay in the word of God, to be doers of the word, okay? To have strength is to take the word in, put it into our hearts, let the word abide in us, and then learn to live it out. Learn to walk in it. Walk in the light, not in the darkness. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word today. We're thankful that your word is so clear to us. We see the evil plots and destruction of the world trying to take people down the wrong path. But your word brings light. Your word illuminates our pathway. Lord, we thank you. Today we pray for our families. We pray for our family members, each one, our our children and our grandchildren. We pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord. 
All those that we know in our families, we pray, Father God, that we could love on them in such a way that they would all come to know you personally as their Lord and Savior. We pray that you would open their eyes to the truth of who you are and your great love for each one of them. That the dark world would not take advantage of them, that they, they would not let Satan run them over in this world, but they would be drawn to you, drawn to your light, drawn to your word. Lord, I pray for salvation for our family members that don't know you, Father. We pray that they would come to know you, that you would touch their hearts, touch their lives, Lord, and use us to do that work. Let us be an example to them of how to live for you, Jesus. Let us be an example in love and character and holy living that we would live pure and holy lives before them. Father, they could see you in us. We pray for strength in that, Lord. We pray that you would keep the body of Christ. I pray today for the body of Christ that you keep, the, keep them from being swayed by the world. That we need to walk down the path that leads to life. The road that leads to you, Jesus, that you guide us down the path by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that the world would not be able to take us off to the right or to the left. That he would not be able to lead us down a path that leads to destruction. Help our minds to be transformed and renewed by the renewing of your word. That your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Father, let your word just illuminate us. And the joy and peace that we have in you, let that be seen by all men. Lord, that we could be an example to the world, that we walk in a different path, that we walk in a different direction the world's going, and let them see that peace and joy that we gain from doing that. Let them see you all over our lives, Father. So help us in our weakness, we pray today, Lord. Help us strengthen us in our weak areas. And I thank you so much today for the gathering together of your people and your word. And, and we ask your blessing upon each one now. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Beneath my feet, your love is a mystery. How you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me.